Hi, I'm Kiefer Fuchs, and today I'm going to be telling you the incredible story of the first Spanish encounter with Native American chief Tuscaloosa. Now, before I get into this, if you appreciate this content, you can donate at paypal.me slash Kiefer Fuchs. It would be greatly appreciated. I will be coming out with consistent content in relation to forbidden archaeology and forbidden history, because as I'm sure you know, if you can control the past, you can control the future. Now, before I get into this, I first heard this account fairly recently within the last three years, and I was absolutely stunned that I had never heard this before, or this isn't something you learn about in school. What you learn about in school, if anything, in relation to uh, the Native Americans, it's the Plains culture. It's after they had already gotten the horse from the Spanish and, and what was going on out west. But you never hear about these mound builder cultures and how incredibly sophisticated they are, they are and what that ruling class really is. Now, I'll stop a couple times and elaborate when I'm going through this because... There are certain things, there are certain details that academia loves to omit from the initial reports because it doesn't fit into their pre-existing paradigm. But when you dig into history and you dig into all the evidence, as we will on this channel, you realize that it is a fact. Hernando de Soto sailed nine ships into Tampa Bay that ignited one of the most fascinating stories between Native Americans and the Spanish. In early spring of 1541, De Soto's army traveled from Florida to Middle Georgia. Some of the officers immediately noted that the people in this region were more advanced culturally than other Indians they had encountered, and were mostly around one foot taller than the Spanish. Now remember, average Spanish height at the time was five foot four, so one foot taller. Think about that. When you think of Indians, Native Americans, do you think of them being... Do you think of them as tall people, or do you think of them as small people? These were the Okanee and the Tamaltli tribe of the Muskegon culture, who in turn were the ancestors of the Creek culture. The Spanish named them Los Indios Giantes, the Giant Indians. De Soto's chroniclers wrote that some of the, quote, great sons, chief priests, of these provinces were seven feet tall. Now, we have seven feet tall people to this day. But back, this is in the 1540s. There weren't supposed to be seven footers back then, especially Native Americans, and especially a ruling class of Native Americans. Now, when they're saying this, they're not saying all Native Americans were seven feet tall, but they're talking about this ruling class in specific tribes. So this tribe specifically, you have people that are six plus feet tall, and then their ruling class up to seven feet tall. This is why academia likes to omit these key details, because it doesn't fit into their pre-existing paradigm. Ask yourself, what's going on here where you have this ruling class of these abnormally large humans? that are extremely culturally advanced, building these incredible mound sites uh, that just, just incredible archaeo uh, astrology. Their vast ter territory extended from Tampa Bay north to present-day Jacksonville area and west to the Akula River, which runs along the eastern border of modern Jefferson County and empties into the Gulf. For protection, the conquistadors took these chiefs hostage and called them guests. De Soto also required the natives to furnish them with porters. The Indians' reaction to this policy varied. After some reluctance, the chief of Okala, quote, an Indian of enormous size and amazing strength. Now, let me stop for, uh, for a second here as I continue to read this. Remember, academia will take these Spanish reports and use them as fact. Um, this is where we get our history from, right? But they will admit omit these key details. Why? Why are we admitting the fact that there are seven footers here? Why are we admitting the fact that these were extremely culturally advanced people? When the chief of Okoa finally agreed to become De Soto's guest, Vidicho, the chief in the neighboring province of Calquin, present-day 
Alcala County consented only after his daughter fell into Soto's hands. But even while being detained, Vidicho and his tall warriors secretly managed two uprising. Copify, the chief of the Appalachia around Tallahassee, described as a, quote, man of monstrous proportions, refused to even meet with DeSoto, but a party led by the governor himself finally captured the giant and brought him in without much trouble because they had kidnapped his daughter. Hernando de Soto's meeting with the giants continued as he pushed further inland. After a winter break at Akamba, Appalachia, he moved through the country with more than 600 men and 200 horses, traveling through northern Florida, southern Georgia, and western Alabama, meeting many tribes along the way. Rodrigo ran. Rangel, De Soto's private secretary, wrote a diary detailing the expedition. The territory they were exploring was ruled by the giant Native American chief, Tuscaloosa. And upon the conquistador's arrival, the chief's 18-year-old son fiercely approached De Soto's cavalry. Rangel writes, seeing him, quote, seeing him, we pause, dumb with amazement, for though but a youth, he towered high a great-limbed giant, heads of our tallest men, only reach to his breast. Now this is incredible. Why would they not teach you this stuff in school? Why is this not a movie? I mean, this is an incredible story. This is why I'm happy to share it with you guys, for the true seekers out there that want to know where we came from and want to know where we're going. After a three-day march, DeSoto and 15 soldiers encountered Tuscaloosa's village and discovered that the chief was even more enormous than his son and turned out to be, to be the tallest and most handsomely shaped Indian they had saw in all their travels. So another uh, key detail, these weren't people with giantism, with a, uh, you know, some sort of disease. These were well-proportioned, you know, handsome people um, were just genetically different than the native stock um it's it's incredible it's incredible that we're not taught this stuff sorry lost my place here his physical measurements writes uh de la vega who was accompanied by de soto quote were like those of his son for both were more taller than half a yard taller than all others. He appeared to be a giant, or rather was one, and his limbs and face were in proportion to the height of his body. He was handsome and he wrote and he wore a look of severity, yet a look which well revealed his ferocity and grandeur of spirit. His shoulders conformed to his height, and his waistland measured just a little bit more than two-thirds a yard wide. His arms and legs were straight and well-formed, and were in proper proportion to the rest of his body. In sum, he was the tallest and most handsomely shaped Indian that they saw in all their travels. After a few days of watching colorful, colorful war dances, Tuscaloosa, completely ignoring the Spanish visitors, took DeSoto, completely ignoring the Spanish visitors, DeSoto took the chief by the hand and they walked together with him to the piazza, where they sat on a bench and talked for several minutes. Tuscaloosa was persuaded persuaded to join DeSoto on their quest towards Mobile. However, owing to the chief's huge size and immense, immense weight, no horse was able to bear him. They eventually found a pack horse accustomed to heavy loads that was strong enough to, to carry the chief, but when he mounted the horse, Tuscaloosa's feet almost touched the ground. The description accords with Garcileo's de Vega's statement that the chief stood half a yard taller, 1.5 feet, than the tallest Spaniard. The tallest Spaniard. 
Though no one recorded Tuscaloosa's actual height, these two, sub- dis- these two descriptions suggest that he was between 7 and 8 feet tall. Now let me add to that. This isn't just one account. There have been hundreds and hundreds of skeletons that have been found in America that echo this claim. While this trekking towards Mobile, two of DeSoto's soldiers disappeared and the scouts returned to warn DeSoto. Meanwhile, a rebellion was forming and hundreds of Indian warriors hid within the town in anticipation. DeSoto stood strong and approached the town and its high walls. A welcoming committee of painted warriors clad in a robe made of animal skins and headpieces with vibrant colored feathers came out to greet them. Some young Native American maidens followed, dancing and singing. DeSoto entered the town with a few of his most trusted soldiers, along with Tuscaloosa and the chief's entourage. The Spanish stood in the piazza, surrounded by a stream of foreign colors and fluttering sounds, but noticed around 80 houses within the village. Several several of them were described as large enough to hold at least 1,000 people. So this is this is a far far scenario from the teepees that you're used to, or teepees or wigwams or whatever that you're used to hearing about in school or whatever. <clears throat> Unknown to DeSoto, more than 2,000 Native American warriors hid behind the walls. After some of the chiefs from the town joined him, Tuscaloosa withdrew from DeSoto. With a severe look, he warned the governor and his soldiers to leave immediately. DeSoto tried to regain custody of the chief, but a tussle between a Spaniard and an Indian chief ignited an all-out battle. Under a barrage of arrows, DeSoto and his men retreated from the billet retreated from the village and regrouped and made a plan of attack when they gained entry when they regained entry into the village they killed the chief's son and set fire to the building massacring around 2500 of the city's inhabit- inhabitants only 18 spanish soldiers fell despite the death of his son an overall carnage left in the wake of the battle, Tuscaloosa escaped, riding deep into the unknown lands. DeSoto and his men marched to capture him, but the great chiefs disappeared with 20 bodyguards. And they pursued, and the pursuing Spaniards found only abandoned cities with massive mounds. During the mid-20th century, archaeologists have found numerous large skeletons between 7 and 14 feet in height. Now, personal opinion on that, because I've read all these accounts. Seven-footers are your most likely. So I would say some of the accounts, like the 14 feet, because they're few and far between, are most likely exaggerated, although possibly not. But anything between 7 and 10 feet, 7 and 11 feet, those are well-documented. I know that sounds incredible. That's unbelievable. But like I said, if you subscribe to this channel and this continues to grow, I will continue to elaborate and share with you all these accounts. Large skeletons ranging between 7 and 14 feet in height and royal burials at the Okolomiji National National Monument and the Etowah Mounds National Historic Landmark. Both of these towns sites were ancestors were ancestral to the Creek Indians So the stories of the Spanish are quite plausible. Creek men today, especially in northern Alabama and Georgia, tend to be exceptionally tall. So that's what I'm going to leave you with today. I hope you enjoyed uh, that story. Um, If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, help us grow here so I can continue.